Mastering 2D operations is essential for any CNC programmer. You're going to be using these as you move into 4 and 5 axis programming. So let's jump into this deep dive of Fusion 360's 2D operations. This video is part of a series of videos where we started off deriving a part into a manufacturing workspace, designing the stock and the jaws, and then making our setups. Now we're moving into the 2D operations, and then finally we'll be moving into machining this project. If you want to get more out of it, head over to our website where you can download the tool library and the 3D model and blueprint at no charge. The tool library is awesome. It allows you to immediately associate these operations with a tool with the feeds and speeds already set up, as well as a link on where we bought them for the absolute best price. We've been using these tools for years in our own personal shop. Uh, we know that you will come to love them like we do. We're picking up where we left off, where we have all of our operations showing our jaws and all the models that are associated with each of those setups. Now we're going to make our very first operation. That's going to be our facing op. We're just going to select project number one, 2D, and our shell mill. Now at the bottom we can say we're going to select that tool. That brings in our RPM, all of our feeds settings here. And then on this operation, we just said OK. He defaults to cutting on the X. So you can see here's the X axis. All those cuts are going to be parallel. There's settings in there that allow you to put it on any angle you want or have it offset the stock or do multiple depths. For roughing this part, we're going to use another 2D operation, 2D adaptive clearing. We're going to select that. For this, we're going to use a 3 8 standard length cutter. Uh, again, we'll just hit select on this tool. We want to cut particular pieces of geometry. If I select the top, he's going to take that tool down to that top piece of geometry. But I can do two things at once when I select the geometry at the bottom. Because now, he's going to cut the Z level at the selected work plane. For this, I don't want to cut into that, so it works perfectly. Now, I also have some passes here, tolerances, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then we have our optional load. That was carried over by means of the tool library <clears throat> for this tool. And then we have our stock to leave. We want to make sure our stock to leave is always bigger than our tolerance. Now, let's click OK. Notice. He already helix is in from the top down to the Z level and then machines that material out. Now we want to also machine these other pockets. This pocket, this pocket, and also the profile as it goes around. So let's start with the profile on the outside of this part. Again, we're going to go to 2D Adaptive Clearing. We're going to select this and go straight to our Geometry tab. Now notice when I select this, I get a perfect profile. And maybe that's what I want because I could just go to height instead of selected contour because it's just one operation. I could say I want to select the point that the Z is going to terminate or be at. Now I can't go to model bottom because I got these balses, but I can select that. And then I want to go probably in this instance 20 thousandths below. I need some kind of tolerance there. I don't want him to end right at that level. But that could interfere with my axial stock to leave. Because I'm not cutting to, an, to a finished edge on the Z level, I can just take this and say zero. That makes it nice. But he will be leaving 10 thousandths on the wall when he cuts this. And then I can say OK. Now he's going to rough the outside of that part. The next two things I want to use the adaptive clearing for are inside. These are going to be a little different because I can select that surface there or that inner profile, but notice that I got a chamfer and it would really be nice if that thing came all the way up. But both of these are at a different Z height. So what I would want to do 
is measure the distance between this surface and this surface. Now that's 30,000. So when I go to height, I could say, well, you need to go negative 30 thousandths or 132nd. But he would also need to go a little further, like we did on the outside, maybe 20 thousandths. And you could say, well, go ahead and do minus 0 0.02. If there was already a number in here, you would need to define that as inches. Otherwise, it might assume one is millimeters and one is inches and not handle the units correctly. Once you say OK, notice that we got two different Z levels or Z termination points, but they still go to exactly where they need to go. But we were able to select multiple contours and able to get that. Now this is completely roughed and ready for some finishing operations. For something like this in aluminum, finishing with the same tool that we use to rough it is just fine. In fact, that's what we're going to do. Now, there's a couple of ways that we can go about it. One, we can come up here and say, I want to do a 2D contour. Or what we can do to save some time is each of these operations have a lot of things in common. One, the tool, the feeds and speeds, and the selected geometry. Those are pretty slick. I wish we didn't have to select all of those things again. Well, you don't have to. <laughs> right? We go to this first one and we say right click on it and we want to derive. When we started this project, we derived a model out of an assembly or out of a model environment. Now we're going to derive a toolpath and take just what we want to make it easier on the next operation. So we're not going to derive a drilling operation out of this, but we are going to derive this 2D milling operations and our 2D contour. Click. Some things they already know you're going to do. And the first one <clears throat> has to do with your stock to leave. It's already gone. It knows it's going to finish on the Z level and on the radial stock to leave. One thing you might want to do is just drop this down to a feed rate or a chip load that accommodates a finishing pass. And then you can say, OK. Now that has finished that operation. We'd want to do the same thing for the next operation, this outside profile. We'd want to right click, derive, 2D contour, and maybe change this down to 1,000th and 2 tenths would be a good finish tool path for this. And then we can look at passes. Well, we got plenty of tolerance if we consult the print and there's no stock to leave, and so we can say OK. Now notice he starts right here on this edge. I'm not a big fan of that. I like my parts to look perfect. So what I do is I go to linking. I look for preferred lead-in positions, and then I find a radius. I click the center of that radius, and that way, when he goes in, he doesn't leave a line on a nice horizontal wall. Uh, he doesn't leave a line at all because it blends into this nice radius. Now we got one more we need to do for these internal bores. So we're going to right click on these and then we're going to say derive 2D contour. Now these have a tolerance on them. So what we're going to do is add some cutter compensation. So we'll use wear on this and then we'll say OK. Now that we have roughed and finished all the major surfaces with tool 2. Now we're moving on to our next operation and say we're going to go to the slot. Click that. And now remember, we need to select our tool that can handle this. If you look at your print, that slot is 0.13. In other words, five thousandths over an eighth of an inch. We're going to select our tool, an eighth of an inch cutter. He's kind of stubbed out here. And now the geometry we select, like we've been talking about, we're going to select the bottom. And we're going to make sure that he goes through the bottom, maybe by 20 thousandths, probably 10 thousandths would be just fine for this. Whenever we select that geometry, give it a depth, it's going to work its way in. In other words, what slot does, it kind of automates this profile ramping. It stays dead center. Its goal isn't to clean the perimeter of that part. The goal is just to rough out that material of that particular slot. Now, if we say OK on this, 
notice what kind of tool path we end up getting. He's spending like, I don't know, like a half an hour, three days up here, you know, and I can't stand that. So let's go back and edit this. Notice that he has a hundred thousands of ramping clearance. That might work for some bigger tools, but for a smaller tool, that's overkill. 15 thousands, that's more than enough. Now notice as he cuts this, he doesn't go off and try to cut the remaining material. He's made a 1 8 inch slot. He hasn't made it 0.13. So then we could right click on this, kind of do the same thing we did earlier, and then just say, we're going to clean him up. Pump the brakes just for a minute, right? Because we only got 5,000s of tool moving left to right inside of this pocket. You know, this is a 0.13 hole. We got a 0.125 cutter. So that means if we hit OK, he's going to go ahead and error out. He's like, I can't do that. I don't know what you're... And we get this little warning, and he says, I can't do it. The problem is our linking. Look, we got 12,000s in radius. I'm going to turn that to zero. It automatically is linked to our vertical radius, like right? the vertical radius, the horizontal radius, and then we get this lead in here. Well, I'm going to take that lead in to 0 0.005 and now Fusion does a pretty good job of finding the best location to start. So I'm going to hit OK and just see what we get. Let's zoom up and see what we got here. He found the absolute best place to go in on that corner where we have a radius on this side. He's got a 5,000th lead in. He hits that corner, walks right around that part, and now that, that dimension is finished. I'd say we just go ahead and knock out this troublesome radius here. Notice that at the bottom of my screen says 0.156. In other words, I'm going to move myself here. I select this. And he is a 5 16th diameter, right? Or a, a 5 30 seconds radius. So that is the radius tool we need. Well, let's go ahead and start with our 2D contour. And that's the operation that we're going to need. And then we're going to say, select our tool. And it's going to be this, what, 5, uh, five thirty seconds radius mill. Select OK. OK, now when we select our geometry, we're going to select the bottom. This is all based on the geometry of your cutter. Because when I hit OK and say, let's just do that. Now, he knows the diameter of the base of that cutter. But all of these radius mills, they have some kind of extension here. And you need to know that because you need to know the distance from the top or the bottom of this tool, or the top if you flip it over, to, to this edge right here so that that radius can blend. Right here when you zoom up, you can see he didn't blend. So what we're going to do is go back and say, I want to edit my tool on this, go to my cutter, and then we're going to find this length. He's got 15 thousandths of length of straight here, tangency, right? He comes down 15 thousandths deeper. So when we go back to our 2D contour, what we can do is just say, um, make sure you go down negative 0.015 thousandths to accommodate for that geometry of that tool so it can work out. And again, what I'm going to do is say, I want this. I don't want it to leave a bunch of lines. I'm going to find the tightest radius and say, start right here. What I'm going to add here is some overlap. I'm going to say, you know, 30 thousandths of overlap where he goes all the way around and then passes that geometry, touches some geometry he's already cut. Get rid of that line. Now you can see that 30 thousandths worth of overlap on that arc. That's going to be a beautiful cut. He's not going to cause any trouble. So to engrave, we're just going to go to the option to engrave, yeah, clearly. And then we're going to pick the proper tool, 2D project. And then we have this, this quarter inch, 45 degree center cutting or pointed 90 degree tool. Say OK. Now this, when you get into 2D, like we've been seeing, it's a, kind of tedious. you got to select the geometry. 
You even need to select the geometry that's within the geometry, like inside that P, because what he's doing is he's taking a look at this edge in comparison to this edge. He's gonna dive a cutter down into there and try to make all those corners nice and sharp. That was an SVG file. We're gonna go into that later. Now, he's gonna go in until he lands and hits. That, that's a 45 degree cutter, you know? And he's gonna try to land until he hits at a depth. I don't want him to do that, right? So I'm just gonna say, I want you to go 10 thousands deep. Don't go any deeper than that and say, okay. The cool thing about engrave is, you know, let's turn off our, uh, you can see our tool path now. He's trying to make all those corners nice and crisp, taking that cutter, pulling him out or pushing him down into it. And it makes a really nice, clean looking text. The next thing we want to do with this cutter is because it's a center cutting chamfer tool, we want to go ahead and chamfer some features. So there's two ways to do that. One, we could hit chamfer and say, I want to do this and this. Now, the reason we chose these is because these have the chamfer modeled on them. Now, that means we would need to add a chamfer width, right? We need to add a chamfer width to this. But the one thing I'm concerned about is when he does this one, will he hit, when, he, when he's cutting this edge here, will he hit the outside? Well, that cutter is a quarter of an inch in diameter, so I could say, make sure you go down a little deeper, and then we'll check how it comes in contact and whether it leaves 10 thousandths or not. We say, okay, there he is. For this, we definitely want to see what the stock's going to look like. We might even want to run the simulation, slow him down, see that cutter come into contact with this part on the top. He's definitely doing a good job. Notice he's, he's not all the way at the top, but he's pretty far down on that 45 degree. That gives me some assurance he's not going to hit the outer geometry here. Let's take a look. Oh yeah, so we stop him, we zoom up, He's got a lot of clearance. Had that been any higher, and he would have, you know, destroyed our geometry. The next one we want to do is this one. For that, honestly, I'm going to go to 2D Contour. I'm going to select the top. That, remember, is 30 seconds. You know, 130 seconds. So I want to make sure that this thing goes through maybe 60 thousands and say OK. That's on the chamfer width piece of cake. Now this one is going to be a little different. Remember when we finished him, we had to control our lead in lead outs to make sure it finished it. We want to select the geometry on the top. Our cutter, we're, we're picking up the cutter that was last used. The chamfer width is going to be zero because it's already modeled. Right? We don't want to add to what's already been chamfered in the model. And then this since he's 30 seconds, we're going to do 40 thousandths, maybe 45 thousandths. We might even change some of the leaking to make sure we don't get this radiuses in here. And this could be 10 thousandths. Let's see if he can do it. Notice he started the exact same location, which is just fine. And he walked around. And now we have finished our setup for op one. We didn't do this little slot here because we would have to have a smaller tool. We're just going to keep it simple and end it like this. Now, in the next video, we're going to jump into doing the backside, which is more advanced 2D operations. So in the next video, we're going to be taking this part, flipping it over, putting it in our soft jaws and machining all of the inside, including some of these 3D operations. But we're only going to be using these 2D ops to do so, so we get a full understanding of how to use these 2D operations. And then hopefully the video after that will finally be machining this block of aluminum uh, in both operations. We hope you like these videos. We really like making them. We hope we can continue to make them. If there's anything you'd like to see us do different, please let us know. And until then, we'll catch you next time.